I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered those remarks in a now famous speech in Memphis, Tennessee on April 3, 1968. Everyone present felt the power of his words, but no one could have known just how prescient they were. The following evening at 6.01, Dr. King was assassinated outside his room at the Lorraine Motel in downtown Memphis. Although he was just 39 years old at the time of his death, the autopsy revealed that he had the heart of a 60-year-old. 13 years leading the civil rights movement, suppressing the fear that accompanied daily threats of violence towards him and his family, had clearly taken its toll. Today we'll hear from Professor Bill George about his case entitled Martin Luther King Jr., A Young Minister Confronts the Challenges of Montgomery. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Bill George is an expert on leadership, a topic that he teaches and writes about extensively, including numerous books, articles, and business cases. He's also the former chairman and chief executive author of Medtronic, and he's the author of this really um, wonderful case that we're going to discuss today. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brian. I can't imagine there's anybody listening uh, who isn't familiar with the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. He's obviously one of the icons of American history and and all of the contributions that he made to our country. Um, But I learned a lot from reading the case about his background and and kind of what was maybe behind the scenes that people didn't know about him. So I thought it was a really powerful case in that regard. And I would ask you maybe just to set the stage for us, how does the case begin, Bill? Well, the case is set uh, about 12 years before that mountaintop speech that we just heard uh, back in January of 1956. This is about two months after the famous incident with Rosa Parks uh, when she uh, refused to move to the back of the bus. And uh, that led to the formation of the Montgomery Improvement Association, where uh, Dr. King was uh, nominated four days later as the president. Now, at the time, he was only uh, 26 years old, so a very young man, to say the least. He later turned 27. But uh, he is in a fearful place. He has just uh, gotten a death threat on his phone using the N-word, telling him to get out of town. And uh, he says he gets about 30 or 40 death threats a day in those days. So it was a very, very rough time in Montgomery, Alabama. I was went to Georgia Tech in the early 60s, and uh, it was a little bit better by then, uh, and, and, and certainly better in Atlanta than it was in uh, Alabama. But a rough time for everyone, and certainly for uh, any African American. Yeah, and so he's he's turning this uh, this invitation over in his mind and thinking about the implications. I- I'm curious, Bill. Uh, you know, you- you're obviously on the faculty here at Harvard Business School. You've been a business leader. You you study uh, business leaders. But what prompted you to write a case about Martin Luther King? Well, at the time, I was introducing my new course, then new course, uh, Authentic Leadership Development. And one of the things we talk a lot about are crucibles that people face. And Dr. King at this time was facing uh, perhaps the greatest crucible of his life that set the stage for everything that followed. You know, he actually had no intention of being a civil rights leader. His desire was to be a great minister, and uh, he had been extremely well-schooled, certainly for an African-American in those days. He'd gone to Morehouse College at the age of 15. By the way, my colleague David Thomas just became the new president of Morehouse. And he had uh, gone on from there to Crozier Theological Seminary, and after Crozier, he elected to go north to uh, Boston University to get his Ph.D., a very famous school at that time as well. And uh, had married Coretta Scott uh, and had a daughter. But he, his great goal was to take over Daddy King's church, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, and he had no idea of being a civil rights leader. And he got thrust into this. And he said if he had more time to think about it, he would have said, no way I can do this. I'm just a, a minister. But he got asked to do this. And so at the time of the case, he is fearful, uh, afraid of what's to come. 
and uh, and pleading with God to let him out of off the hook because he says, I have no courage, I'm weak, and I want to get out of here, and I just can't do this. Yeah, you mentioned his father. What was his early childhood life like? What were the sort of things that shaped him? He grew up in a middle-class environment, and so he had a reasonably good environment, and his mother taught him self-respect. His father was a strict disciplinarian who would, would engage in whippings in those days. But at age six, he was playing with a, a white friend of his, and his parents told him, you can't play with uh, my son ever again. And he said he resolved to, at that point to hate all white people. Uh, then uh, his parents said, no, no, you don't understand. You're a Christian, and that's not what Christians do. We love our enemies. We love people, and you must uh, change your point of view. And so that was a very positive environment he grew up in. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, around him, there was a tremendous amount of racism. I, I was really uh, stunned in the case when I read. So you mentioned the fact that he went to college at a young age. But uh, he, he talks about the fact that when he got there, uh, even though he had graduated from high school where he was, he was only reading at, what was it, an eighth grade level. Yeah, he was reading at the eighth grade level. and uh, But he had some very famous teachers, uh, Dr. Benjamin Mays, Dr. George Kelsey, uh, Mays was then president of Morehouse, but they all became mentors of him, and they were ministers that really encouraged him to serve humanity through the ministry. Yeah, and they also encouraged him to continue his education, which was highly unusual at that time, right? Well, certainly for a minister as well. I mean, uh, if an African-American was fortunate enough to get into medical school or law school, probably in the North, that was one thing. But ministers, uh, and he almost didn't want to go into the ministry because he saw most African-American ministers who were not educated, and he was a real scholar. And his sermons are filled with great depth of biblical knowledge. And he had really become quite famous well before he got to Montgomery for speaking around the country at Baptist churches. Yeah. I think it's also interesting because the case starts to shine a light on on the person that was Dr. King and some of his own insecurities. He, you talk about the fact in the case that when he was in graduate school, he was con so concerned about his appearance and how he appeared to people, and he was overdressed and his room was spotless. Can you... You know, talk a little bit more about some of the insecurities and the fears that he had that maybe led to his crucible moment. Remember, he'd gone from Morehouse, which was a uh, historically black college, to Crozier, which was predominantly white, as was Boston University. There were just a handful of blacks there. And in a sense, he felt he had to be do everything perfectly. He had to show up on time. He had to be well prepared. He had to do much better than his uh, fellow white students uh, in order to be accepted. And so he was extremely careful to do those things and not get himself in any kind of trouble or not fall short. And in some ways, I think he felt like he was a role model for other African Americans who might follow in his footsteps. Yeah. And of course, we know um, he didn't do all of this alone. Coretta Scott King was a hugely important influence on him. What made them such a good team? And, and I wonder, like, could he have been as successful without somebody like Coretta Scott King kind of pushing him from behind? I think Perhaps not. She was a great partner for Dr. King. She was a scholar in her own right. She had studied music, uh, had a great singing voice, and uh, she basically gave up her career to support him in going to Montgomery, and she was a real partner. But he always said she was the stronger of the two. He felt he was weak and that she was the one that would stand behind him and give him the strength to take on these leadership roles. And uh, the crucible we speak of here, Brian, is really a turning point in his life which he had to make the call. Did he stay in the ministry as a minister in churches, or did he use his ministry as a calling to help African Americans and attack the uh, problem of racism? And uh, he actually uh, gets down on his knees and prays and asks God to let him off the hook and not have to do that. He said, I just can't take it alone. And I think he knew he needed the support from above as well as from his wife, Coretta, uh, to go forward into this very uh, troubled environment and, frankly, very violent environment. Yeah. Now, is, is that, in your experience, having, you know, talked and, and worked with leaders of all kinds, I mean, how, how common is that? I, my guess is that most leaders aren't able to do it alone, and they need somebody to help them, and they need to be willing to accept help from other people. Exactly. And particularly, a lot of people try to act like they can do everything themselves, but they need help. And the higher up you go in leadership, the lonelier it gets. The fewer people you can talk to, the fewer people you can look to for support, and you need that support team around you. But I found, Brian, that almost every great leader 
goes through these crucible moments, uh, like Nelson Mandela did. Even Jim Burke in Tylenol the second time around was very fearful. And you don't know what's happening, and you need people around you to support you and be there for you. And uh, in order to give you the courage to step up, uh, perhaps not be shot at like Dr. King was or put in jail for 27 years like uh, Mandela was, but certainly to be attacked and criticized from all sides. And that takes enormous courage, which really is a distinguishing characteristic of the great leaders like Dr. King. Well, yeah, and even in the excerpt that we hear at the opening of the podcast here, he was he was very fearful right up until literally hours before he, he was assassinated, but he was able to overcome those fears and kind of push forward and I guess compartmentalize that, that kind of thing. You know, as we look around the world today, Bill, I'm wondering, are there people or individuals that you can think about who are able to step up and, and, you know, play that kind of a role? Well, in the business community today, we have leaders with enormous courage. And as you know, we have a very powerful president of the United States, and we have people that are willing to stand up to him and uh, do the right thing by their companies. Uh, I'm thinking of something like Mary Barra at General Motors, who, and where they've said you can't have a supply chain that goes around the world. Well, she's plunging full speed ahead and doing just that. Uh, in the U.K., Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, was attacked by uh, the uh, Brazilian firm 3G, tried to take him over. And he has been the great advocate for sustainability. And I'll tell you, Paul, uh, I read his posts every day. He has not backed off one bit because he knows how important this is, and he believes very deeply that companies that do the right thing by sustainability will perform better. So, yeah, I think we have a lot of business leaders. Andrew Nui at PepsiCo is another one. Alan Mulally was at Ford. We have some leaders of great courage today, and I'm very encouraged by the kind of leaders we're turning out in the business community that have risen to the top and realized their role goes well beyond making the numbers to satisfy their shareholders, but they have to uh, do something to really make a difference in the world through the power that's vested in them with their companies. So it's quite analogous to Dr. King and what he did. Yeah, that's great to hear. <laughs> it gives me more confidence, I guess, going forward. So you've discussed this uh, in class, I'm, I'm guessing, with both the MBA students and probably executives. And I'm just wondering, you know, what's the response? Uh, how do people react to reading about Dr. King? Well, they're very moved. And of course, I try to put them back to, the, to this issue back to them. When have you ever faced a situation where you were scared, you wanted to get out and uh, wanted to be let off the hook for your leadership roles? Are you prepared for this? And how prepared are you? And I think that's a really important thing, not just to think about it like a great leader like Dr. King, but let's take it down to ourselves. And how does it affect me? All of us have had a crucible. I've had students tell me that they too were not allowed to play with uh, white children in their neighborhood and how crushed they were and how they carried that with them until they're at HBS, which was 20 years later, and how uh, impactful that what seemingly simple experience was. Uh, and so these things uh, are, are very formative in people's lives, and I think it's important that our students at HBS and other people studying business get prepared when they do have to step up to the big one, because if they aren't prepared for the ones that come earlier in life, they will not be prepared when they get the really big challenge. Yeah, really, really great lessons, Bill, and a terrific case. Uh, thank you for discussing it with us. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I'm thrilled that we are honoring Dr. King every year on the anniversary of his birthday, because what could be more important? What a great leader he is, and we need to venerate the great leaders of our time like Dr. King. Terrific. You can find the Martin Luther King Jr. case along with thousands of others in the HBS case collection at hbr.org. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, the official podcast of Harvard Business School.